Dzień dobry. Uh, good morning. I'm Stefanian. Very nice to meet you. Uh, I know it's early and I'm the first talk, so this is going to have to be very, very energetic. The good news is that I work with kids, so I'm used to be very energetic. Um, today I'm going to talk about reading, writing, and tinkering with AI. Uh, my name is Stefania Druga. I'm a recent graduate from MIT Media Lab Personal Robots Group, and uh, my research is about AI education for children. So before, before jumping into that, why do I say read and write? Many of you might recognize some of these titles. How many of you have read at least one of these books or heard about them? Okay, Lynn, <laughs> that was to be expected. <laughs> So the first book here, um, actually this term of reading and writing was coined by Lawrence Lessig, who's also one of the fathers of Creative uh, Commons, these open licenses we're using for sharing code. And in this book, the Remix Manifesto, he talks about the importance of not only reading the web, but also writing the web. Um, and moving those ideas forward in this book uh, that is called Democratizing Innovation, which is actually available online, that you, you can read it, it's available for free. Um, Eric von Hippel also makes an argument about why it is important to allow people to read and write the web and code. And he talks about open source. And I, I guess that if you're here at Pi Data, many of you know why it is important to share code uh, and data and why it is important to foster open source communities. But Eric von Hippel actually makes an argument that people not, don't do this only for altruistic reasons. They do it because it's actually the best way to solve complex problems, right? And if you democratize, if you share your tools, if you share your knowledge, people will use it in ways that you do not expect. Um, and if we take that from the digital domain, from code to physical things, um, in this book by Cory Doctorow, which is also available online and you can download today and check it out, it's a really good book. He talks about how that works, how does reading and writing, how does tinkering apply to the physical world, right? So what happens when we can read and write uh, not only code, but also devices, uh, controllers, anything from your Arduino and Raspberry Pi to an old phone or what have you. So this is the context in which my work has been developed. In this culture of democratizing who can access ideas and build with ideas, and how do we keep, keep ourself, ourselves in check with our work by making it publicly available in a way that it can be used, remixed, and uh, repurposed by many other people. So from the digital age in today, we actually have an entire generation of kids that are growing up not only with code and digital applications, but also with AI. I know in Europe, it's, we're not quite there yet, but in the US, we actually have more than 47 million people who have an Alexa at home. How many of you have heard about Alexa? Okay, more hands. Yay, you're awake. <laughs> um, so, you know, these devices were made by big corporate Amazon with the main purpose of selling us things. But they are presenting, presented as this intelligent home assistant that can answer any question. And here's the crux. They were not designed for kids but we have an entire generation of kids that are growing up with this technology. And just like we grew up with internet and we take for granted the fact that we could do a single search from our phone, from our pocket, these kids are gonna take for granted the fact that you can just talk to everything and ask a question and get an answer. So that's going to completely change how these kids perceive technology, learn with and from technology, but also how they talk to their parents, how they talk to their friends, right? So I've been working with kids for a long time. I'm going to date myself now, but basically in 2012, I've been working with kids for 
uh, more than 10 years. In 2012, I started this organization called Hackidemia, where the idea was to learn by doing science and technology and hack with kids academia. So uh, I, I got a lot of articles where it's like, she's doing a school of hackers. Yes, I'm doing a school of hackers. And that's not crackers. The, import the difference is quite important. Um, so we were doing these workshops with kids all over the world and training local mentors like yourself to work with kids. And then we did a project that was funded on Indiegogo in Africa, in 10 African countries, where local communities would pick a challenge in, the, in, in their town or in their um, village and say, okay, we want to build a prototype to improve the way we access energy or improve the way we filter water. And then they would prototype and learn how to do that and then teach it to kids. But then you would say, like, what do we do if we don't have like a local makerspace or hackerspace or even a library? And that's when we start doing these camps in shipping containers. So the idea there was like, if you don't have a space, an invention lab where you can start building and prototyping, we're going to build one for very, for very cheap, actually for free. The first one we did in Berlin, we were able to get a shipping container from a recycling company and all, all the tools donated um, and have a lot of people, we put it right next to the Berlin wall and have a lot of people coming in and starting to hack and then we could move the container uh, and even ship it somewhere. So this is the type of work I've been doing before. Uh, and I should say that I come from here. So for me, it is very important. I, I am Roma Romanian, which is not that far from Poland, although I live in the US now. And I come from a small village called Manechu Unguren, which is here in the Carpathian Mountains. So when I grew up, I did not know that all of these things exist. Like I did not know that I can solder or program or build robots. And it took me a very long time to reach to a place where I could even know that these things exist so I can learn about them. And that really motivated me because I realized that what differentiates us is not only how smart we are and how hard we work, it's also what opportunities we have access to. And once the fact that you're here means you already are, you have a lot of opportunities, right? So once you have access to those opportunities, it kind of comes with this responsibility of sharing back. So when I grew up and I learned like, oh my God, you know, I can do synthetic biology and I can learn about nanotechnology and I can, I, I couldn't help thinking, imagine if I would have learned about this when I was six, when I was seven how much more I could have done. And that's what motivated me to start Hackademia. And then I would meet girls, like this girl is six. This was in Berlin, like long time ago. This is 2013, who was soldering at six, right? In a normal school, we would not allow a girl at six years old to solder because it's too dangerous and she might get burned, right? So we are trying to change the educational system and the way we teach with people who are products of the same system who think that we should separate kids by age and we should differentiate what they can learn at six, what they can learn at seven, what they can learn at eight. And I'm gonna tell you that that's purely false, right? Who are we to decide when and how a child should learn something if they're curious? This is a living proof that this girl, you know, like her parents, two days later, they call me, where can we buy a soldering iron? Like she was at this for two hours. She wouldn't even make a, take a break to, take, to drink water, right? So I think what I'm trying to say here is that learning happens everywhere. And learning is not tied to institutions and it's not tied to diplomas and it's not tied to titles and all of that. It, it is actually a thing that happens in community. It's a thing that needs to be playful, needs to be uh, experimental, and it needs to be fun, right? Like that's one of the key things that I learn from kids. We explore and discover the most amazing things when we're having fun and when we're playing. So taking this from the maker education, the science education, the coding education, and thinking how do we bring that into the future? Because like I told you, it's not up to us what the future of AI ethics and AI applications, and it's actually up, up to our kids. How do we prepare them for this future that they're growing up with? So when I start to look into this, um, I discovered that there were these two devices. I don't know how many of you have seen 
this creepy doll or this other device over here or know what they are? Yeah, go ahead. Can you tell us? This is Aristotle. Very good. So this, is, this was Mattel. You know, Mattel is one of the largest manufacturers of toys. This was Mattel's attempt at creating an Alexa for kids. It was supposed to be launched last year for Christmas, and they didn't do any research to see how kids interact with AI, how they perceive it, how they trust it. And they just said, we're going to put an entire division, invest a lot of resources, and create a, an AI for kids that has a camera. You can put it in the nursing room. It can track your kid everywhere. Um, and we're going to launch it for Christmas, so you can put it under the Christmas tree. And guess what? 15,000 parents signed a petition, and they were like, hell no. Never before a corporation was able to store so much information about our kids. Why would we let you into the nursing room? <laughs> you didn't even ask us if we're okay with this or not. So there was a huge backlash, and we see this over and over again with Hello Barbie, huge backlash. But these like toys manufacturing companies, and even all the big companies, I, I don't think they're learning from these lessons, right? So they had to pull out this. This was never launched in the end. They had to pull out this, this product. And then this doll, it's called My Friend Kayla. It's a Bluetooth connected doll. And it was hacked five days after it was released in Europe. So it's currently banned in Germany. You cannot buy it because it's not a secure device for your kids. But in US, you can still get it on Amazon. It's only $29. Right, so this is not really like the face like of Armageddon at all. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have connected devices for kids because that is the future. I'm just saying that we need a lot of research and much better policies and much better regulation for how these devices should be designed and how they should be put on the market. So when I started to look into it, like two years ago, there were no papers about how kids are interacting with current AI devices. And we've done a pilot study with 26 families. We brought 26 families at Media Lab into the lab, and we put different stations where they could interact with Amazon, Alexa, with the, my friend Kayla, with Cosmo, with Google Home. And after they were playing with these devices and their parents were playing with these devices, we asked them, is it smart? Is it smarter than you? Is it friendly? Do you trust it? And we found quite a few interesting things. First of all, there was a big difference in age. Like smaller kids, three and a half to six, weren't so sure that the devices are smarter than they are. All the older kids from six to 10 were saying, yeah, Alexa is smarter than I am. And I'm like, how can it be smarter? You ask questions that it couldn't answer. He's like, yeah, but it has so much information. It's smarter than I am. So for me, I was like, wow, there's something here. How are these kids positioning themselves in front of this technology, right? And clearly it has something to do with going to school where intelligence means regurgitating a definition that you were taught, right? But I also think it has to do with demystifying how we market and present like this intelligent devices and intelligent toys. So let me show you a quick video uh, to see how kids were playing with these devices. And let's hope that the sound is gonna work. Today's children are growing up with social, intelligent, and relational devices found in their homes and their schools. This is my colleague Randy. We did the study with. together. What do children think about machines that think? To engage this question, we ran a study where 27 children between the ages of 3 and 10 interacted with different devices. They played games. This is Cosmo. They asked questions. Alexa, what does dinosaurs eat? Then we ask, is it smarter than you? I think she's smart. Well, I okay, think she's smart. That's smart. Finn said that she's not as smart. Is it like a friend? Well, he's, he know my name, so mm -hmm. he's good. Does it have feelings? He actually asked to look, and she said, yes, I have feelings. We saw that children anthropomorphize the AI in playful ways. <laughs> the voice and language determine how intelligent and playful the AI seemed. Google 
single home was like, I know everything. You can mm -hmm. ask me anything. But Julie was like a normal person. She sounded like a normal person. Julie is a chatbot. Mm. And she, it felt like she actually understood what I was saying to her. We both. <laughs> so I'm just going to show you the final make question. Make us think about our own nature. Hey Google, who's your best friend? It's hard to pick, but if I had to, I'd pick you. Aww. So it's endearing, but oh my god, like really, can you imagine? Like if you tell a child who's like five or six, I'm your best friend, that child will actually believe you, right? Or if you replace a Google search with a box that will tell you the same first result, but with a friendly voice, we're not going to question it in the same way, right? And this is what we're doing right now. So because I told you that I was very intrigued by the fact that they said that Alexa is so much smarter than they are, uh, I decided to do another study and really investigate more what do kids mean when they say smart. Maybe the way they say smart about machines is different from the way they say smart about people, right? Um, and we had a, a study where we invited 30 families and basically, they would um, watch videos of a mouse solving a maze, and then they would watch videos of a robot solving a maze, and then they had to solve a maze by teleoperating a robot. So the reason we did this is because we wanted them to compare like um, animal intelligence with robot intelligence and with themselves. And the kids and the parents participated in the study separately. And it was very interesting because here you can see like a child solving a maze and the parent solving a maze. And it was very interesting because we actually saw that older children would mirror, would have the same choices that their parents did more, more than the young kids. So not only that they would choose like, oh, the mouse was smarter or the robot was smarter the same way their parents did, but even the language they used to explain why the robot was smart, they would say, oh, the robot was smart because it was programmed, or the robot was stupid because it was programmed, right? And then they would explain, oh, it has sensors and it has a map, or, oh, the mouse is very smart because it smells the cheese. So the way these kids even build mental models and think about this, it really reflects the way their parents talk about these things and think about these things. And the older they get, the more they copy their parents. Even if they had robotics workshops or coding workshops, and you're going to say, of course, Stefania, what you're telling me is not a surprise. Of course, parents influence their kids, right? Yes, they do. And that's why we show that it's important not only to teach kids, but also to teach parents. Because if a parent would say like, oh, yeah, Alexa, no, oh, it's intelligent, or like, it's smart, it's artificial intelligence, or if they would actually encourage the kid, like, why do you think it says that? How can you probe that? How can we test this? Is this true, right? So we need to have like a learning culture for the entire family, an AI literacy for the entire family, not only the kids. And the other thing that we see from this study is also the importance of starting very early. The younger the kids are, the more open they are to consider many different scenarios and the more prime they are to develop a more critical understanding of this technology. And I would also tell you that I discovered things that really kind of like blew my mind. Like I had a lot of four and five year olds that had seen multiple robots but had never seen a mouse. And they were ask asking me if the mouse in the video was a robot, right? <laughs> and then another thing we see is again, we need a lot of new words, like we need a new epistemology. The fact that people, when they talk about emergent intelligence and emergent behavior, they, they say, okay, it's smart because it's programmed. And when they say that, they refer to an algorithm or some sort of capacity of the robot of recording what's happening. Or they say it's programmed and it's stupid. It's the same word, but they refer to, oh, it just receives some simple instructions, but it doesn't know how to uh, apply those instructions in a different environment. So you can see that when people talk about AI, they say programmed. When they talk about simple coding, they say programmed. So we need new words to actually start to think about at which point a simple learning mechanisms of detecting edges and colors become something more than that. At which point we get this gestalt phenomenon, right? So. 
we we there's a lot of work to do <laughs> and basically this is this is the part about the the new words and you can see some quotes from from the kids and the parents um and and then the the next study and this is uh i'm not going to bore you with too much research or although that's what i do i also code i'm going to show you some code as well but because i told you about my friend kayla right and how it got banned in germany uh, you're going to say, okay, they think it's smart, that's great, but how much can these devices actually influence kids? And I'm going to tell you that the answer is a lot. So we did another study where it was a conformity study. How many of you have heard about the marshmallow study? Yeah, so the marshmallow study was the study where you would want to see if the child would actually be able to self-control and not pick up a, a marshmallow if the researcher would leave the room. I'm overly simplifying it. But basically, in, in this study, we tried to do a disobedience task and see if the doll could convince the child to open a box. And then we did a conformity test where the child would actually watch videos that were saying, is it okay or not okay to hit another child? Is it okay or not okay to stand when everyone is sitting? And then they would uh, play a game and then the, we would bring the doll and the doll would try to change the answers for the kids. And the doll would say, I think it's okay. I think it's not okay. And then we measured how much the kids changed their answers. So we had three conditions. One condition where the kids were with the doll, one condition where they were with a confederate, which is another person, and one condition which was the control condition where they were alone and just watching the video two times. And what we found is that in terms of moral questions, the doll would be more efficient at changing children's mind than a human confederate. So a child could actually, when prompted by the doll, would change more his questions in, to, to morality questions like, is it okay or not okay to hit another child, than he would do in front of a human. Now, of course, this is just a pilot study and we're actually doing follow-up studies. But, and there's many reasons for why that could happen, right? Maybe they were just trying to prompt, they were trying to test the doll and see how would the doll react. Or maybe they were just playing. Or maybe they were less afraid to change their mind in front of a doll than in front of an adult, right? Either, in any of those scenarios, this shows that children can actually be influenced by these devices, right? You can imagine a scenario where someone like hacks your Alexa or a smart doll and tells your child to buy things or go and do things. How do we know, how do we make sure as developers, as parents, as you know, civil <laughs> engaged members of the society that this will not happen, right? And how do we prepare kids to know what is okay and what is not okay from a smart device uh, to ask from them? So basically what I'm trying to say is that I think a connected family should not look like this, right? How many times if you travel a lot like I do on planes, you see this and even at home, right? We are connected, we're so connected now that we don't even know how to do more simple things like playing and talking to each other. We need to design technology to help us go back to something that was so natural before. So I want families to look more like this where it's not just the kids who are learning how to code and learning how to tinker with AI, but it's also parents who are supporting them and doing it together. And for doing that, I created this platform that I call Cognimates. Uh, it, it's like a learning companion. So the idea is that you're learning AI by making and by coding. And my first, first extension was by using this like open source robot. It's called Ergo. It's done by Inria Group in France. And I build an extension for it, and I'm going to show you what you can do with it. It's using scratch blocks to program it, but then you can also train it motions. So you can teach it how to draw something, and then it will replay the motion you showed it. So it's kind of like learning by demonstration. It also makes mistakes, which is very cute. Train it to act happy or behave like a dog. And because it's 3D printed, we can change the heads or change its configuration. But then over time, we can start to teach it more complicated things like how to play games with us, like rock, paper, scissors, or 
throw objects or collaborate with other robots.、Um, yeah, kids have a blast. This is their favorite activity, the ball throwing.、Um, And so on. And then after the Ergo robot,、um, I start developing a similar interface. So all of the programming interface is using visual blocks. So it's a visual blocks language、uh, based on Blockly, which is open source, and Scratch, which was also developed at Media Lab. So the next extension was for Jibo, which is another social robot. And I really like this example because. Again, going back to the idea of play and tinkering,、um, this is a girl who is seven. Her name is Tiana, and she never programmed before. And then I showed her Jibo, which is the social robot. And then the first、uh, initial version of the platform I built. And then she made this game, which was like very simple in terms of code. And there's actually a mistake there. There's also a forever loop. Um, um, be, uh, so it happens all the time. So basically, the robot. Has the attention on, which means it's always tracking like sounds and motion. And if it sees more than one person, he would say, "I see you." And Tiana made this game to play hide and seek with the robot, but she played for half an hour, right? So these are the type of projects that lead to very rich learning experiences, where the code is very readable, anyone can understand it and remix it and change it. But the playful interaction is very rich, and we don't have kids only sitting in front of. Computers, but we actually have kids playing with these devices in the real world.、Um, so the good thing about having this kind of like、um, social robots and embodied intelligent agents is that they can also play a role in the learning process. So imagine there's no teacher, parent, or mentor that has the time to be there with the child. The robot itself can play an active role when it's being programmed, and it can tell you if you did the right thing or not, or how you could do things differently. And that looks Hi, like this. I'd like to know your name, so let's do a program that allow me to learn it. Let's start with the green flag block. So this is Jibo trying to teach us、There、how to、go. teach him his our name. No, I need you to help me ask a question. For that, we'll need the ask block. See if you can find it. Awesome. He's encouraging us when we're doing the right、not、thing,、me. or like prompting us to do something else when we're like not using a loop, for example, or、uh, could do could refactor our code. And and what's cool about this kind of interaction is that we see a lot of collaboration. So we see kids programming with four hands under the table. One of them is touching the robot. Another one is going and changing the code. And and that's what we want to see. We want to see like. And also we bring parents in, right? So we want to see. And then the parents don't dare to go to the computer, so we give them a tablet. So you can actually program Jibo from multiple devices at the same time. So they're like, "Oh, look what I did!" and "Look what I did!" So they're like starting to share these experiences. And from those initial like prototypes with Ergo and Jibo, Cocknimates is now online. You can play with it. It's open source and it's free.、Uh, it's Cocknimates.me. And we have many, many more extensions. So anything from programming your Alexa to programming Microbit. But if you don't have any hardware, you, there's a lot of things that you could do just in the browser on a phone or in a tablet. It looks like this. It has one part where you have the visual blocks that I was telling you about. Then in the middle, there's the coding area where we put the blocks together. And then on the right side we see the stage, so it's the output of what we're doing.、Um, and if it's physical, then the output would be in the physical world. And these are a couple of examples of extensions. So the, the extension we built for Alexa, Cosmo, which is another smart toy, Jibo.、Um, but then there's a lot of extensions we did for cognitive services, like detecting feelings from text, or sensing colors. Or getting image classification results, so we wanted to provide kids off-the-shelf AI APIs, but then we also wanted them to train their own. And I'm going to show you that in a in a second. So, how do you build such an extension? So, usually you find like a useful and interesting API, and then you define, okay, what kind of blocks would a child need? What are the primitives? Then we're going to write functions for what those blocks are doing. And then we're testing it in the browser. But before doing that, you need to come up with a cool idea, and usually that comes from kids, like stuff like controlling robots in the water with your mind, which is actually something we did, right? So <laughs> we made an extension for the Muse headset, and then like for the Lego Wido, 
And then with the clock image, you can actually connect them together. So for the API you, or like node modules, we, we're just requiring that. You can see here the, the sentiment variable, which is requiring that node module. It's using the affin uh, data, database for, for sentiment analysis. And then the way we define blocks, this is all JavaScript. Um, the way we define blocks is we have different types. Uh, we can make a block be a hat, which is the block that executes code after that, or a reporter, or um, a command block. And then these blocks are calling a function, and then we just define a, a JavaScript function, which will go to my API and pass the text I'm typing in the block and say, what kind of score is this text? If it's more than a specific threshold, is it, it's going to be positive. If it's less, it's going to be negative or else neutral. It's extremely simple. This is one of the most simple extensions. It's 90 lines of code. All of our code is on GitHub. Um, if you search Cognimates on GitHub, you're going to see it. And then basically what you see from a child perspective are blocks like this. And again, the language matters a lot. And this is where we iterated a lot with kids because it turns out that the kids that I'm working with, seven to 12, know what a feeling is, but don't know what a sentiment is, right? So uh, we had to change sentiment to feeling. And then we realized that they really like questions. So instead of having a block that says, get the feeling of text, it's much better to put a block like, what is the feeling of the text, right? Um, so in this case, we actually have like a character that is reacting to the sentiment of what messages we're giving to, to it. And if we have more than that character, if we have Jibo, we can make Jibo react to the sentiment of messages we're giving to it. This is Tiana showing how that okay, works. Tiana, can you explain to me what you're doing? I'm running out of time, so I'm going to like skip through it. Um, the example for the Alexa extension, I'm going to skip through that as well. Um, and, I, and I told you that after they use off-the-shelf APIs for vision, computer vision, or sentiment analysis, kids train their own models. So we're using IBM Watson in the back end. So they're only, there's like, a, we're doing transfer learning. They're only uh, training the last layer. So they can build their own classifiers for text and for images. So we build like a interface that is like really, really simple for kids to use, where they can say, okay, add your category. What do you want to teach the computer? I want to teach the computer to recognize cats versus dogs or rock versus paper. Um, and then I'm going to add 10 examples of images and then click on this teach me and then teach the, the, AI, um, the computer how to recognize this, it would give me a model ID that I can use in a block and then I can program my own game, right? So usually the way I scaffold this when I t teach kids is, okay, if you want to make your robot react when you're saying kind messages, if you didn't have a classifier, you would only be able to make it react to specific messages. But if you have a classifier that can recognize all the kind messages, then you can make it react to everything you say. Um, and this is kind of how it looks like when kids are training AI and <laughs> building classifiers together. Here they were trying to build a model to recognize trains. Um, and then they have the most like fascinating um, explanations, you know, or, or ideas. It's like, how can we, um, yeah, it's going to learn what the picture are going to be. Uh, and, and once they train the model, they want to confuse it. So they're like, okay, we taught it to differentiate like dogs from Kirby's. What if we put a dog with sunglasses? What would it do? Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a quick... Oh, yeah. And, and then the other thing that is interesting when they train their own models and their own classifiers is that they start to see the nuances, right? It's not only good versus bad or black versus white. I actually had kids that wanted to train a model to recognize backhanded compliments. I didn't even know what that means. Backhanded compliments is when someone says something nice, which is, which is actually not nice. Like, um, oh, you look so good for being so tired. 
something like that. And then the kids wanted to have a sassy chatbot that would recognize these uh, messages. So this is what happens when we actually allow them to create the data and train their own classifiers. Um, and then like they love games, so they created a lot of games that they could play with the computer or with a different robot. And here's a video where you can see them explaining it. We show children how a robot sees the world. How does it learn to recognize objects? How does it know to recognize words? Are you a potato? We also allow them to be able to teach a robot or a computer. I'm gonna give you 10 examples of images and then you're gonna learn what a gesture is. So every interaction you have with it, it's kind of like a conversation. So you're having this learning companion, this cognimate that is learning with you and teaching you at the same time. So we were programming robots. You could play rock, paper, scissors. Okay. You did rock, paper, scissors into the camera and on shoot you did one of the motions and the camera did one of the motions and it's like rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The computer gets like better as you play the game. Cause like us, we might not know everything at first, but if we keep trying, we get better. Everyone has heard about like machine-based learning or artificial intelligence. And there was a certain no questions asked for a lot of the more tech savvy parents. It was like, go for it. Technology is going to be a huge part of their lives, much more so than my life. If it's scary for some people, this AI technology, I totally get it. But as a parent and as a teacher, I thought it was really important because these are skills that 21st century kids need to have. When they understand this idea of a feedback loop, that the more information you give to a machine or a robot, the better it becomes. Hey, Debo, how smart are you? It really allows them to understand how machine learning and AI is different than just coding. So I think this is a very powerful paradigm for children. So they understand that when they have an Alexa at home or a smart assistant, everything they do, the way they talk to it, gets fed into the algorithm, so the machine is actually reacting to them. When my dad was young, he bought a car and took it apart to see how it worked. So you teach people that young how these things that grown-ups mostly program, how it works. So yeah, seven-year-old think that AI are like the cars of their generation. And it's important to take them apart and understand how it, they work. And the good news, going back full circle to the studies I showed you in the beginning, is that after testing this in schools for six weeks, more than three times per week, uh, we saw that kids would actually change their answers to this question of, is it smarter than me? Do I trust it? We saw that they became much more skeptical and, uh, of AI technologies, but they also understood much more how and when they can use it. And this is really what I'm hoping to do with Cognimates. Um, and I'm going to skip through this because I actually don't know how much time I have, but um, I, I basically, I invite you to, to join me in this, in this adventure. And I hope you can contribute to our open source code. I hope you can contribute to mentor future workshops um, so we can have this learning happening for kids from everywhere, right? In public schools, in local community centers, in maker spaces, so we can have collaborative and playful activities. Invite everyone, our parents and grandparents and cousins. Um, have immersive creative AI camps. You, you might recognize some of the people in this picture who actually came to this camp we did in Berlin. Like I think Piotr was there um, and Aga. Um, and you know, from leaders like Justin Trudeau to like kids in a church. We actually did workshops in church, in, in a church in, uh, in Cambridge with kids that never coded before. Um, we can actually allow kids to be part of this conversation of how we shape the future of AI. So Cognimates is started just as a research project, was my master thesis project. I was kind of surprised that there was people like playing with it and testing it all, all over the world. Um, and yeah, I, I hope you will check out the code. There's lots of bugs to, to fix or discover um, in your work. Write good API documentation and specs so we can make extensions and we can make these kind of tools that make your work available to a non-technical audience. Mentor the generation that comes after and play, right? Because that's what it's all about. So 
yeah, this, this is not just my work. This is my team. Uh, not everyone is there. There's two more people. Um, I was joined in this crazy adventure by five MIT undergrads, which were phenomenal. Um, and there are 18, by the way. So <laughs> you can really do this work at any age. And thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'll be around if you guys want to play with Cockney Mates or have more questions later. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Yes, one question. One question. Yes, one qu Yeah, there's one. <laughs> Thanks for, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I have one question regarding the interaction between, between parents and the kids in this program. Mm -hmm. uh, so imagine that the parent uh, works in AI or <laughs> software development. Uh, that parent has a different conceptualization of the entire field. Uh, do you, did you notice any difficult, difficulties in communication between parents and their kids regarding how they interact with robots, if the kids learn better with a different conceptualization than the, what the parents are ex using mm -hmm. to explain them? What are the, the difficulties with people from tech teaching their kids. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. So um, the question was if, I mean, you guys heard it, but like, I would say the hardest part of my work, um, and this kind of work in general, is dealing with parents. Um, parents and teachers. My mom is a teacher for primary school. It's like, for adults, it's much harder to be in a growth mindset where you are not, the, there's only one way, or this is the right way, or, oh, if you didn't use the correct terms, you don't know what you're talking about, right? Uh, and be more playful and Socratic and understand how much we're learning with our natural intuition and by playing and by experimenting. And maybe I have the wrong term and the wrong concept, but if I'm poking enough with what I'm doing, I will figure that out, right? So... The, the important thing in working with parents is to get them excited so they become kids again. And you probably saw in the videos at some point there was one of the parents and he was doing stuff and the child was doing stuff. You guys were smiling over here. So very often, like, it turns out that playing is like riding a bicycle. We never forget it. We just need to remember it. Um, so I would say as soon as I get the parents to go into the child mode and start playing again, it doesn't matter what field they're working in. Um, it is sometimes harder if the parent comes with a I'm going to teach you lecture mentality instead of, oh, let's figure this out. Um, but it turns out that this is so new. So even if the parent is working in AI, maybe it hasn't played, he hasn't played with Cosmo or Alexa in that way. Or, so it's, it's the, the experience is like engaging and interactive enough for people to play together. But there is a lot of work to be done in terms of mindset, right? And leaving room for kids. I talk to kids and treat kids like adults, even if it's a seven-year-old. And they feel that. Like, that's the part of the presentation I skipped, which is the co-design. It's like, if you take them seriously and you really listen to what they have to say and their ideas, and I show them, like, I changed the platform based on what you're telling me, right? You want this block. We're going to build this block. You want to change this. We're going to change this. You want the character to be scary. We're going to make it scary, right? So it's like, if you leave room and actually... Let the t kids teach us because they see things and they have ideas that we don't anymore because we are like, you know, we're in our path. Um, then I think a lot of magic can happen. So I don't know if I answered your question. It's hard to work with parents, but I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks. It's a matter of curiosity, right? Yes. At any age. Yes. Thank you so much, Stefania, for your Thank talk. You. Thanks. Great round of applause, please.